Okay, so thanks a lot for coming to my talk, and thanks a lot to the organizers for giving me the chance to give this presentation here. I don't know how well it fits into the overall program, but I'll try my best. So uh, the talk is was tentatively titled "Challenges in Visualization, Interaction, and Simulation." I, I'd subtitle at this point "Random Blurbs from a Researcher Slash Game Designer" because I don't really think it's as coherent as that title may suggest. <laughs> So, but I'll, I'll try my best. So I, I'm here in the computer science department. I'm a computer graphics researcher, previously architect engineer. Now I'm turning into more of a game designer. I'm trying to find the research agenda in game design. The origins of the things I'm gonna be talking about are mainly the fact that I've been teaching this for the last two years to computer science graduates. And uh, 40 people have graduated, a lot of people have won awards for their games, and they do this all in about 14 weeks. So it's a very tight course, and people either love me or hate me, depending on whether the game is good or bad. Um, I've also made a video game recently that won an award and was nominated for a few awards called Osmos, which I'll show in a demo in a moment. Um, the last couple of years, because I've become more interested in this topic, I've gone to a lot of talks, panels, roundtables, and read a lot of blogs. And fact is, most of the information that I'm going to be reciting today that's not necessarily my contribution is not from research communities, in fact. Because research communities haven't done that much in this field yet outside of the humanities and the arts, not so much in the exact sciences. And yeah, I, I, I do play games which is, I guess, not a big surprise. So, kind of trying to merge my hobbies and my, and my professional life. But to start off with, I'm going to show a little motivation of why I think what I'm talking about is important. So, a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about is minimalist game design and how to utilize low dimensional input and get high dimensional output and interesting outcomes. So, from a research point of view, what I've been doing the last couple of years is more in the direction of interactive shape modeling. And for that, the key demo that I usually give is this tool here where the user can do something in 2D, but what actually happens is something in 3D. Right? And then the user can click on a curve here and move parts and drag stuff around, or carve parts out of other parts. Right? But it's always, it's always a 2D operation, but it does something in 3D, but the interface is always 2D. And it turns out that when you show this application to novice users, the biggest problem is not the construction or the drawing of the curves or any of these things, it's, it's this. It's orienting the shape in three space. That's just an additional degree of freedom that most novice users cannot deal with at all, and that has been painfully, painfully overlooked in user interface designs and game design in the last decades. Right? So th this is my approach to why I think why I think what I'm talking about is important. So yeah, it's a, it's a game talk, so it has rules, right? Like a game, so. It's a workshop, so I don't think I have to recite any of this, so just interrupt me, and if you have any ideas on this, please interrupt me and tell me about your ideas, because I, do, I really rely on this, for this to work. It's the first time I'm giving this talk, because yeah, as I say, I'm a structural engineer, architect, computer science by profession, and uh, game design is not necessarily my research field. Right. Do you use these rules to actually write a game? That is, find yeah. a group of people that are willing to. I'd always say no. I'd always say it comes from. I come from all kinds of perspectives, and in the end, maybe rules emerge. But in the end, you can always write down the rules, right? Like once you have a game, there's obviously a formal system. So I first made the talk, then I write down the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Game design and research are very similar in that it's all very exploratory. I try stuff out, and then in the end I see a pattern emerge. And then I, later on, write up a paper saying that I always had that idea. <laughs> right. I think you can say that about most research papers that, I, that I've written. So anyway, there's a lot of definitions for games. There's a lot of people that try to rigorously formalize games in some space. And I mean, these are usually the things that people come up with. They're, they're a meaningful interaction within a dynamical system. They have rules, they have goals. That people are not sure on what the goals are. I personally think they can be explicit, implicit, or even sense pleasure. There don't have to, doesn't have to be something explicitly encoded into the system that says you have to do this, right? 
Many games are based on exploration and sense pleasure. They can contain resources, and games are always, this is like something I feel very strong about, always abstractions of something. They're always a value system in some way, shape, or form. And to show what I mean by that, I'll demo the game that I made, or that I collaborated on, I should say. And this is, again, same approach. We, we explore something, and then we realize that we're onto something, and we call it minimalist game design. So the idea here was make the input space as small as possible and couple all the concepts that I just listed, such as resources and goals and strategies, very tightly, which is not necessarily the case and requires a lot of iteration and thinking, which I realized over the last two years that we've been working on this. Can someone dim the house lights a little bit? So this oh yeah, right, sorry. Okay, so the, the basic principle, and this was like the first gem, and again, similar to research, the principle holds that the idea took us probably like three hours to come up with, but then we've been working the last two years. So the idea here for the input is I have, wait, I have the mouse cursor here, I hope you can see that, I'm, I'm jiggling it around now, and the only kind of input is the movement of the mouse cursor, and once I click with the mouse, I actually eject parts of myself propel myself forward. That's the, that's the basic principle. Right, so once we, once we realized this, that we could couple the size of the player to the propulsion system and make that a low dimensional input, which doesn't require anything else than mouse clicks, and maybe a little bit of positioning or mouse, which I think most people are familiar with, we thought we were onto something, and after that it turned into a two and a half year iteration phase of trying out all kinds of different things, such as then very simple principles of being able to absorb things that are smaller than you and of course be absorbed by things that are larger. Right. And I just like that. So then from there on we went and came up with three different branches for different three different kinds of people that might be interested in the game. Because first of all we realized is the game actually is something that, can, that doesn't require a lot of hurrying and rushing. Right, so I can do nothing, and nothing necessarily bad will happen. So I can click two or three times and then just watch the system play itself. Right. So in this setting here, there's just a lot of stuff. Right? <laughs> and there's no intelligence, it's all there's not even gravitation. Right? It's just me moving, essentially trying to become the largest thing. And then we came up with a smart algorithm that would essentially generate infinite levels of this kind, just making it harder and harder procedurally. So this can go up to level, I guess, 100,000. I've played to 70. I think that's as far as I can get. You already start off as like a little key. But the distribution is always such that you can meet the level. We always check for that. But it gets more interesting then when we go on to actually incorporating things such as gravitational effects. So the gravitational effects then go on to form something more like uh, a planetary body system with orbital paths. So here we're rendering the orbit a little bit transparent. And if I start interacting with the system, you'll notice that my orbit changes. This is just the physics playing out. This is not something that we're trying to explicitly compute. Right? Is this a three-dimensional world or two-dimensional? This is fully two-dimensional. Yeah, very Newtonian. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we, we just heavily tweaked the, the parameters to make it playable. Because something that we quickly notice is that once the character gets very large, inertia takes over and you don't go anywhere. Or you have to eject all of your mass to move anywhere or change directions. Right? So, of course, obviously, I can also modify this in such a way that eventually I'll just collide with the sun. Is the music we're hearing tied in any way to the visual information, or is it totally a, an independent thread and you're just generating? There, there are a few localized effects happening that depend on whether the character is closer to the sun. But other than that, it's not procedurally generated. The collaboration here is with uh, ambient artists that were interested, that we showed the first prototype, and they started scoring our game. So this is something that just miraculously happens when one makes a game. A lot of people just want in on it these days. So. 
But no, the, none of them were interested in time. They, they very much were. But what happened there was that we, uh, we invited them to do this, and we gave them the, d the design idea of what we wanted, and it turns out that they have day jobs. <laughs> and that they don't have the resources to do all of our crazy little ideas. Because this is entirely, at this point, this is an entirely hobbyist project. So this was self-funded, so to speak. We hope, like, this is going on sale in August, we hope that it'll change. At least for one of the developers. I, I have a job. <laughs> so the third question. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you've seen the... Uh, you played school, right? Yeah. At what point in time did, in the development of your project did you place for and see the initial... Oh, I, so I know the lead designer of the Creature Creator. He's a friend of mine. So I played a very, very early prototype. And he immediately... The, the principle of eating something that's smaller than oneself is, is, is extremely old. Of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason that I ask is because aesthetically it, it reminds right. me of it. I think your game is, is beautiful. And I, think, and I will definitely buy a copy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I really, it, it's something when I, when I first played Spore and saw, you know, the, the, the ocean phase, I really appreciated the depth of field effects um, in, in that obviously two-dimensional system that gave you the sense of depth, which you, you, visually you're doing a lot of those things here. It really gives it a, a nice atmosphere. It's a compliment. I'm, I'm, oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I've had, the defensive part threw, fell away like a year ago. Because people are like, oh, you're, you're making flow and spore, and of course they compare it to all these other games where the essential principle is to eat what's smaller than you. But yeah, so we try to stay away from that a little bit. It, it's really, really hard to do that if you want to do a game that's supposed to imbue a sense of relaxation. But we, we kind of tried to get individually, like, get unique with the music and a little bit of the art style, but that's also not entirely true because the art style is heavily inspired by a website called flight404.com that does processing oh, yeah. visuals. Heavily, heavily inspired by that. Sure. Yes? Man, do you make an effort to make this a multi-person game in some way? We, we get that request. That's the second high, highest request after the Mac port, which we don't have yet. <laughs> <laughs> and the, 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 the problem there is we'd only be able to do that on a local computer basis, whereas most people would like to have online multiplayer. But because of the non-deterministic physics simulation that's going on here, the amount of data that would have to be synchronized over the net is near impossible with a lot of, it would cause a lot of lag. Yes? I, I don't know much about it. Can you put it? Uh as an iPhone app in Bluetooth? <laughs> That's the third highest request. <laughs> That's the third highest request, and I'm buying a MacBook tomorrow because of that. <laughs> I've never worked on Apple before other than the phone, but I'm very much in love with the phone, so yes, I'm going to try to port this to an iPhone. Yes? Well, you began your talk by saying something very intriguing, minimal inputs, with yeah. maximal outputs. And now you're telling us that your inputs are not minimal anymore? The inputs from the player are minimal. The inputs from the simulation are not. Okay. It's just, there's a, there's a big difference, and I'm going to elaborate on that once I get back to the slides. Which <laughs> is, sorry, taking way too long. Um, that, the, yeah, I'll, I'll, get to, I'll get to that topic. There's a big difference between interacting directly or interacting with a system in a, ga in a game design context. So anyway, I'm still going to show the last branch here, and it's essentially, yes, of course, people then asked us, or we are, want to do this ourselves, also is to include the notion of an intelligence. So in this case, there actually is another character that has an AI tied to it. See that guy up there? Right now, he's an edible, and he's also not very aggressive, right? He's not even, I mean, I really literally have to commit suicide at this point. But this is the dumbed-down version of that AI. We, of course, first made an AI that is near impossible to beat. It's like the optimizer. And I think, I'm not sure if he's down here. Yeah, of course, I'm called Survival of the Fittest. And then it becomes a game of challenge. So this, this thing here is much, much harder to, to approach. And even I would take like 10 minutes to do that, and also I'm not going to go into details on that. Oops. So yeah, that's, that's what one can do with two and a half years. Oh, um, I got another question. Yes. Yeah, survival is really cool, but 
reproduction is also really cool. <laughs> <laughs> so do yes. you have plans for mitosis and building families of these? Right now we have cancer. We have other canceling. We have antimatter levels. We have various things along those lines that I'm, that I'm I guess, not allowed to talk about yet. Because I'm now I'm all now 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 we have like a, a publishing contract and so it's turning into this it's, it's just going off into all directions I didn't ever think it would go to. But yes, we're thinking along those lines. We're thinking more along those lines of things that don't create entropy that just would merge things and construct things instead of destruct and consume things. So, but these are all like these are all like next steps. I'm not sure it's going to make it into the first version of this. Fortunately, it's coming out on Steam, and Steam allows one to digitally update the product whenever one feels like it. So, so yeah. Briefly, mouse click smoke collision. That's it, right? There's not a lot of interaction. There's Newtonian physics that are heavily tweaked to make the game playable. In fact, I'd say that 60 to 80 percent of the time that went into making the game was tweaking parameters to just make them feel right, and then giving it back to people and getting feedback, and going through this iteration over and over and over and over again. Right. There's a couple of rules, there's a couple of goals, but we really, really want to go for the combined become the biggest and sense pleasure, so that people, uh, so my collaborator always says he wants to make a game that you could leave, like go for dinner and come back and then continue playing. That's his ideal of a game. I don't know if I fully subscribe to that, but I find it intriguing because it's it's not something that's been done before. He doesn't trade in the stock market, apparently. No, no, <laughs> no. In fact, right now he quit his job at Ubisoft Montreal to go live in Nelson, British Columbia, which is in the middle of nowhere because the snowboarding is good, and he and he's going to be working on this full time. So, definitely, definitely the opposite, the contra opposite of the stock market. So, right, and the resources, and this is, I, this is what I believe is why we're winning awards for this game right now, is that the size is coupled to propulsion. And there's always a trade-off between your size and what you're doing. And this is just something that always intrigues people, and when they see it, and you give this off to testers, and you're standing behind them, and you have to shut up and just watch what their reaction is, and even ignore that they ask questions. They'll usually look at it, and then once they get that principle, you'll see like a nod. And that's usually a sign, or like a smile or something like this, is usually a sign when we know that, okay, now we get the sweet spot, right? I don't know how scientific that is, but I, I believe it is, and I believe it can be quantified, and I believe that that's something that needs to happen in the future. So, these are like guiding principles, and now these are not rules that I came up with, but this is essentially something that's really, really important, and it's overlooked by many, many game designers, right? There's two concepts, and these are the key concepts in game design. An interaction from a player should be discernible and integrated. Discernible meaning that when I do something, there needs to be an immediate effect that, so that I know that I interacted with the system. This is something that most games, I mean, like 95% of games on the market get very, very wrong, which is why many people just say, I don't like this game, and then they say, when people ask them why, they're like, I don't know, but it's just not good. That's usually why it's not good. And the other thing, which is a little bit more, is the integrated interactions. So this is where the outcome has long-term consequences, more strategies, and the actions in earlier stages of the game have later impact. Spore is a good example for that, by the way, because you're doing something in the cellular stage, and then later on, your creature grows from whatever you did in the first part. This is not, obviously, limited to digital games, right? because I think the godfather and the best game ever made is chess, and this is a game where Every action is discernible. You move a physical object. And either you have a tactical situation where you're trading off immediately and removing parts from the board, or you're adding pressure to certain parts of the board, which have a long-term impact. But there are specifics to digital interaction. Right? And but there's, there's, this is what I was talking about. Like When you're interacting with a system in a game or in any kind of simulation, there's the direct interaction, which is virtually tactile. I should, but it's not really necessarily tactile. But it's usually the form of grasping, pulling, pushing, or shooting in 95% of the cases of marketable games these days. And there's interaction, interaction which is usually presented to the player if it's well done as a state change. Right? It's like I do something, and then things happen. Like in Osmos, when I click the mouse, my character moves in a direction, but I eject a part, that part might hit another part, that part grows because of that, 
and the entire coloring of the scene changes based on what's smaller and larger than me. This is something I didn't directly influence, but it's very, very important that that's there because fact is contemporary games and systems have really big problems simulating direct interaction. It's because we only have stuff like this. And I'm going to argue furthermore that this is sufficient and probably enough and we do not need more than that. We do not need a bunch of interfaces that are sensing wherever I am and all these other crazy things. Okay. I'm not going to bash the Wii mode. I think it works very well, but it only works in a very small, limited sense. So instead, what people do that make successful games is they operate on state manipulation through abstracted direct interaction. Right? So the abstracted direct interaction in Osmos case is a click. Theoretically, one could say there's a, some chemical reaction going on in the mode that I have to create that part that I eject, and then there's a physical thing that happens when I eject it. And all these little things that happen, I'm not simulating that. Very abstracted. So the way I map these things together then is that the uh, abstracted direct interaction are the discernible actions. Right? These are the things that need to happen immediately. Whenever I click, there needs to be something that happens. Whenever I collide with something, there needs to be a vi a audio-visual feedback, multiple redundant systems of audio-visual feedback that give me the information that I need to make sure that wherever I'm looking or not listening or someone's talking to me, that one of my inputs makes, like, makes use of this information. Right? And then the integrated actions are the state changes. These are behaviors, strategies within the game, but uh, they're also generally simplified. Right? They're, not, they're also nothing like I'm not doing an accurate simulation, especially not within the game world, because a player will not necessarily study this game for the next 3,000 years. Right? It's going to be something that might be interesting for two hours. So I do not have the luxury of a game as, as a game designer to be simulating some in-depth system. It has to be something that's easily perceivable. So now I get to the whole remote thing. Right? Why is abstraction necessary? It's not just something that comes because we don't have the resources to simulate the real world. Right? People can throw hundreds and hundreds of people at a game for the next five years and come up with the most intricate rendering. It is possible. But there's also parts of things that just need to be abstracted, right? And the best thing is what I really see is about the Nintendo Wii, because it who's, who's played on the Wii? Okay. So it works really, really well when well, first of all, again, it needs this direct this direct feedback. If it, that doesn't work, it's terrible, right? But it works well for bowling and throwing and minor pulling things. Really, really breaks as soon as collision is involved, right? So one of my students once came to me and said, I want to use the Wiimote to simulate a sword fight. And he really, really wanted to have, like, he was trying to use LEDs and all, like, to augment the system so that it would track better. And I, uh, he did it in the end because he was a very strong-headed person and I couldn't get him off of it. But uh, he afterward realized that I was right because as soon as you have one-to-one -one mapping, you expect high fidelity of feedback. It's just something that you do as a human being. So the way they usually do it in games is because they can't do that. When you want to swing a sword in a game, they usually like make you do something like this, and on the screen there's maybe just one swing. Right? And that breaking is deliberate and important, because if it was one-to-one, -one, you would also expect that when you touch an object, that the thing has some sort of tactile feedback, and not just a stupid little vibrate. Right? It needs to directly like, block your movement, which it does not. And I do not think that's going to happen in the near future, and I don't think it has to. Right? Yes. In medicine, you have those machines in medicine to, to make virtual operations. Can you have the different setting? Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> it's a, this, there's a very there's a specific reason. This is, it's, a, it's a game, right? Plus, the hardware is very expensive. The important thing about games these days, I find, is that it's ubiquitous and many, many people have easy access to something like this. And that can be, well, I'll get to that later, but this is something that should remain in that realm. I think that's the strength of games these days, one of the big strengths of games these days. You do not want, or I personally do not want people to have to buy $500 worth of hardware so that they can indulge in something that I would consider an important pastime. It's a philosophy. It's just a philosophical, philosophical question. Yes. But aren't you basing your argument on uh, the technology, the current technology? That is, that five hundred dollars is going to be five dollars in a few years. Okay. 
okay, but it's never, but, but it might not ever shrink in size. I don't want to have a force feedback robot arm in my living room, right? I, like that's just that's, but that's a personal view. Well, I'm saying you won't need that. What, what? So I'll have magnets everywhere that push me through the room, or? I mean, we're we're largely wireless now. Yeah, but how, where do I get the force feedback from? From a wireless device? So, so the object of meshing was not very big. I was allowed to perform a virtual operation. Okay. Pencil like. Yeah, True. There's there's phantoms that do that very well, and they and they might be very you're, expensive. You're a, you're a very interesting toroidal magnetic field, and you're <laughs> perturbing it all over the place. That that I warned that I warned about that in the beginning of the talk that it might be a disjoint blurb of a lot of things, <laughs> and it's not going to get any better. I should have <laughs> no, I'm, I'm saying our, our perception of you, whether you, it partly depends on that magnetic field. Oh, know? okay. And, you know, these are things that uh, a greater amount of computer power can have access to. I'm not saying it's not ever going to happen. I'm just saying with the current technology state, mm -hmm. I think that's already good enough. Like, that's already good enough to make something that's, in tr that's inherently very enjoyable by the majority of people. And I do not require this additional layer. I'm not saying that it's not worthy to go for that. I'm just saying that I personally am not interested in that. I think we can make I think we have enough at hands now already to make do to make to make the things that we that we should be doing with this medium. And I don't think it's been explored enough. I mean I'm gonna argue well, you'll see my argument. So yeah, this is a game that was very successful in the day, and it still is. And my wife loves it, and she loves all kinds of games along these lines, but she hates games. And my, I, I seriously, I, the thing is, I mean, I, she's a computer scientist as well, so she enjoys the puzzle element. But after many, many conversations with her and many other people, I've come to realize that what works for her, again, is the fact that this has a very, very low input sensitivity. And you just, it's discrete motion. It's just moving parts in discrete steps. It does have some part that where, the, where the blocks will fall, which the player has no influence on. But it's essentially three degrees of freedom, one, two degrees of freedom, rotation and left-right translation. Right. So that whenever I give something to her and she doesn't like it, it's always because the input to space, space is too large. And she does not have the patience to get through that initial barrier even if the game is great. So that's just the point, yes. Uh, I once heard that this is one game that men and women like equally well. And the explanation of why women like it, and this is, I apologize at the outset, this is, I'm just repeating it, is that women like to organize things. And this is an organization game. And I have to admit, I love this game. I've heard that argument too, but I know people, like I know people that are incredibly unorganized that love the game too. Uh -huh. so I, yeah, as a game designer, we're usually trying to appeal to the largest possible audience and get it out to as many people as possible. But yeah, this is something that game designers think a lot about: the the input versus output sensitivity. That's what they call it. It's this low dimensional input space, infinite dimensional output, or or tractable finite dimensional output, I should say. So Tetris input and feedback is all discrete. That's what works for, for my wife, at least. Learning the controls is trivial. Right? I can give this into, to any person, and they just get it. It's not hard to comprehend how to control the game, but it's really, really hard to master. That's always the, the hallmark of an excellent game, that's incredibly hard to get all the little possibilities down and understand them. Right? But for that, I mean, even, even Pajitnov, and there's a great BBC documentary on how he made the game. If you, it used to be on Google Videos, it got pulled, but if you ever get a chance, it's, I think, From Russia with Love, or, or something like this. It's called the documentary. It's, it's excellent. Because even he went through many, many, many iterations of the game, with different shapes and blocks and numbers and whatnot, right? People just need to do this, and this is something where a lot of game designers fall, and they just don't go through the much-needed iteration to make a game good. 
So the next part I'm going to talk about is visual abstraction. This is this is this is not everyone's taste, but if you, I don't even know if people can recognize what this is. You know, on Tetris, you didn't have a coherence of music with what was going on. This is true. And that was that's <laughs> catchy, isn't it? I, I can I can probably I probably sing the melody, like yeah. even, like it's it's because I've played that game way too much, obviously, like in cars, trains, everywhere. But yeah. Music is an important element that has not been explored enough yet. There's a, there are a couple of notable examples, which I'm unfortunately not going to be talking about today. And I, I'm going, I'm painfully over time already, so I'm just going to move on. So yeah, this is Botticelli's uh, Birth of Venus as a pixel art. Right? This is not just the nearest neighbor, neighbor downsampled version. It takes a lot of work to get to something that even remotely resembles this. But uh, Scott McCloud, in his book, Understanding Comics, talks about something which he states is the map of visual iconography. And I find this is really important. So the book is great. It's called Understanding Comics. If you've never seen it, I urge you to get it. Um, but in my opinion, his major, major contribution in this book is, is exactly this map. So he talks about a space of abstraction, where the lower left represents photography, or like the visual resemblance. The lower right is iconic abstraction, pure cartooning. And the top is the pure abstraction, the picture plane. And then, of course, there's some continuum between the left and the right. It goes then into words and writing. And there's all these different things that you can look at. So he uses this to analyze comics and different styles and abstractions. And I find it's also a very interesting tool to think about games. Of course, his way is showing this is how comics are artful. And I think the same. I pretty much think the same holds for games. So what I usually call like areas of game design iconography. I usually try to stay abstract, which is what you can see in Osmos, because quite frankly, it's a lot easier to do, especially if you're using programmer art. Right? Then you have like it takes much longer to iterate these things. We could get an artist in, but at the same time, I heavily believe in why do I need to do that if I have an idea of how to do it myself. So I saw Ken Perlin's talk yesterday. He always talks about the Renaissance man. I think this holds very true for games, and the newer games that are designed by little teams or individuals are those that strike me as. What most well-designed games and most intriguing in terms of what's on them, what's there right now, and which directions this should be going. <coughs> so there's usually regions that I classify. This is why I show students so that they're aware of the fact that when they're building a prototype for a game, they should in fact not think about the rendering. So I've gone so far as to say that during the prototype stage, they're only allowed to use squares and circles in 2D and color them and layer them, but nothing else because I really get annoyed about seeing a game that has sprites and sound and whatnot, but controls like, like, like whatever, right? So it's really, really important that they get that first stuff down for it and get that down right. And on the bottom left, I have this thing called the potential uncanny valley. So I'm going to talk about that more in a second. There's a lot of people, a lot of people in games that do this well, stay away from there. Pixar stays away from there. That's why it works. Right? It's really important that if you don't know what you're doing, that you stay comfortably away from that uncanny valley. For those of you who are not familiar with the concept, <laughs> it's from the 70s, from uh, Masahiro Mori, and he uh, observed that in robotics, the human likeness is kind of linear to the familiarity with the object up to a certain degree. And once it gets closer to near human, then the reaction in fact inverts. Right? It's not even, I don't have a familiarity, it's almost like an invert, it's like a negative familiarity, it's more like an aversion. Right? And uh, that, that's why this sh stuff should stay away. So now I have a couple of examples here. This is a still from a game that's coming out this year where the developer, quote, says that they have overcome the uncanny valley. <laughs> I beg to differ. <laughs> and this is a still, it gets worse in the animation. Right? So I'm not saying this is bad. I'm saying that at this point, my eye as a gamer is, yeah, I can, I, I can believe this. But oh my god, is that, like if I show this to anyone that doesn't know games, they're like, what? What? <laughs> like, what is this? Right? So that doesn't work. This is, this is a surprisingly also a computer-generated image, which I think is a lot better. But I don't know. Like, it doesn't do it for me. But that's because I look at this stuff all, all the time, right? I mean, the hair, no, the skin, even if it was an airbrushed version, right? So I still don't buy into this. 
But fact is, still images are continuously improving. And I, and I personally believe it's just a matter of time. So I do think that will be solved. I don't even, I write potentially solvable. I think they're close to that for still images. They, I don't do rendering, but in graphics, I know people that do it, and I think they're really close to simulating these things. But would you speculate on this time? If you mean for the stills? Like five years? Ten? For, the ki for, for this kind of image, I think we're very, like, in, on the order of maybe five years. For other things, like I have a student right now that's simulating modeling of translucency in, in, in organic objects, such as fruits and trees and all kinds of other things. That's really, really not solved. People can barely simulate light diffusion through a leaf, which is two-dimensional. And doing that in a volume is, is an open research problem. So there, it's unclear how long that will take. Well, I think the implications are very interesting and in it enhances our capacity to lie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that compositing this into real images with realistic lighting is already near solved. The reason this doesn't work yet for me is I am not I don't have enough elements that are masking my perception. As soon as I put this into a real scene with other real things, I'm, it's going to be much, much harder for me to detect which part is the computer-generated image. Right? So this, the, the uncanniness of this image just comes from the fact that it's in isolation and it's entirely computer-lit. So, so I'm pretty sure that the still is, is going to be solved. But for human animation, the problem is exacerbated. People have really, really not figured that out yet. I'm trying myself in that right now, but it's, it's incredibly difficult. Because again, we have to abstract away most of the things that make human motion and all the little productions that are going on in our brain. Obviously, modeling that is infeasible or not even known to man. So still, I think, so with motion capture, that works. Like a lot of things, I mean, we've seen a lot of results of this. I've seen a lot of motion capture lately, even in games, not only in feature film, where this just works. And, and because the example was on the slides yesterday, Gollum works because he's not human, quite frankly, right? Again, staying away from the uncanny valley is very important in that respect. But it's really hard to do that for physical interaction in games, and I know this because I know people that are simulating grasping tasks in video games, and, all that, and they always have to add some invisible handles. Right? It's really, really hard to simulate. Some, the most arbitrary things we do as humans are really near impossible to simulate. There I'd also say, with a lot of research effort, it's potentially solvable. <laughs> Decades, probably decades, before the question comes up. Two, three, maybe more, maybe maybe not at all, but I think I think it's potentially solvable. People have done really incredible jobs of combining motion capture with physics animation, and it looks it already looks very very real on stick figures, right? So once the skin comes in, it gets a little bit trickier, but I think they're onto something. But no one cares, <laughs> literally, no one cares about digital interaction. So this is my whole, my whole statement. This is how computer graphics research has been going in the last three decades. There's a lot of rendering. Everyone wants pretty pictures. It's easier to convince someone to give you money to grant or grants or to, to support something like this. Animation is very important for feature films, but interaction in a digital world is people, and I'm aware of HCI research, and I'm aware of all these fields that look into these things, but they're more interested in solving these things in the world that has been created by rendering and animation. They are not interested in solving the problem in a lower dimensional subspace where the problem would actually be tractable. So my argument is that what's happening is that rendering and animation has overtaken digital interaction by orders of magnitude, and no one is really looking at how to interact first. This is why 2D games with low dimensional input have so high success rates. And this is why I think this is the space in which this research must occur before moving on to 3D navigation, which no one can do except for the people that make the product and the, and the designers who painstakingly learn how to use 3D modeling tools such as Maya and other things. But it's just, it takes way too long, yes? I'm sorry, are you saying that the success of the 2D game marketplace is because all this money has been spent on solving problems that work well in that space, or you're saying... There, no, there, in fact, there hasn't been a lot of money spent. The people that are doing that 2D interaction right now is not even research. It's small, independent game developers 
They're sitting at home, hobbyists, not getting any money, and are going back to that space, which they're doing because they don't have the resources to work in 3D, but inadvertently, they're doing the right thing, and I've talked to a lot of these people, because I, I am one of these people, and they are not aware of the fact that they're doing themselves a favor, implicitly. Right? That they're actually not only, it's, it's, like, it's like an artistic movement. They, they have this self-imposed restriction that they don't have the resources to go into 3D. But what they're doing implicitly is they're putting themselves into this situation where they can only work in that space, and therefore they are solving problems that are open and have not really been stated in research yet. Yes? If you don't have the resources to work on the rendering or the anim animation, you want something successful, you have to focus on gameplay, making the game fun. Right. That's why so many of the classic games are like the Apple II are just They're great. unsurpassed. Right, right. And, and if you talk to people in the game space, they'll say, oh yeah, it's like, generally people immediately take the scapegoat of nostalgia and say, it's all nostalgia, you love it because you like pixel art, or you hear the 8-bit sounds and you're 12 years old again, right? That might be true, and I think I'm gonna to get to that in a second. That might be true, but that's not all, right? So, anyway, you know what? I'm gonna brush over this really quick. I'm just gonna say there is an uncanny value of interaction. And people in these 3D spaces, in these highly detailed environments, will try to simulate these days something like emotions and hugging and kissing. And it's repulsive, to be quite honest. <laughs> Like, I, I, I click away those cutscenes because it hasn't been explored in a lower dimensional space yet. All right? It's really like interaction in these, in these highly detailed worlds is limited to destruction, shooting, and weird interaction with strange people. Like, it's just, it's, it's definitely, definitely not there. Like, who, I, who's ever tried uh, Second Life? Okay, so Second Life, it's good that you don't, like, because you don't have to, literally. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, don't waste your time. Like, I, I find, again, it's a space that is essentially empty and void of any meaning. So I, I can just tell you, don't go there. It's, again, it's a strong opinion, but I have it, and I've tried it, and it's terrible. So... Do you have any idea how many people do go there every day? Uh, the last, uh, it's, it's, on, it's on the downfall, but I think at some point there were like a couple of million, two, three, four. I'm not, I, I'll stop with my opinions now, so not to, not to dig like a hole that I can't get out of anymore. But uh, yeah, uh, people do stuff. So uh, yeah, meaningful interaction in photorealistic environments, in my opinion, it just doesn't exist. The notable example is exploration, and it's arguable whether exploration is a form of interaction. I'd say yes, right? because again, like me exploring the space in Osmos is a, is a form of interaction and watching the physical simulation play out. In a really beautiful world, I've seen people go into games and watch a sunset if it's been done really well. So one could argue that that's, a, that's, a, that's like a step in the right direction. Right. Now I'm gonna show, to conclude, I'm gonna show a couple of examples of things that I find are notable. And people have, like, things that people have been trying. And interestingly, the first example I'm gonna show is done by a single person called Rod Humble, who is the head of the Sims Studios at EA. Right? So he, is, I guess, I guess he gets frustrated with with all the stuff he does. So he fiddles around with little abstract games on the side. So this is something he did in a weekend to simulate his marriage. Right? The only form of interaction in this game is mouse over onto what I would assume is the male and the female. Right? And the kissing act is the touching of the edges of these two, of these two squares. And the other things are external occurrences. Right? Now, obviously, this is a very personal experience, and it's not something that everyone will share. But I think, I think one can agree on the fact that the, fa that the mere fact that he's doing this is already valuable. And this is something that could not be explored outside of an interactive environment. This is something that in this form at least, could not be explored in a poem or a book or a movie. Something where I am not the person actually doing it. So you can see, I, I'm not doing anything, right? I can just watch this play out. Or I can say, well, okay, maybe, I, maybe they should get together again. And then I mouse over one of them, and the two just essentially just start going together each other again. Right? There's various interpretations, and winning this game, like actually reaching, reaching death in this case, is not as easy as it looks. It generally doesn't happen just by letting it play itself out. Right. 
So What's that, the implication of uh, the events disappearing when you mouse over them? Uh, I'm not really sure what that is. He doesn't give away everything. So this is probably this is probably this is interesting because it's about two years ago and it's the first time someone self-proclaimed this is an art game. Mm. Like I want to prove that games can be art. And then giving away a statement with like a couple of the explanations is already admitting failure, according to the artist in this case. But I find it's an interesting experiment nonetheless because it doesn't doesn't require any it does, has no sound, doesn't require any crazy rendering. And the point being, there's obviously, just like in that map of visual iconography that I showed you a while ago, there's a continuum between kissing of two squares and kissing of two virtual actors that is entirely uncanny and not believable yet. I'm very interested in where that slider is currently, and I don't think anyone's really looked into that. And I, I quite frankly don't know how to do it yet, but I'm looking into it. Second thing, this is uh, a game by Jason Rohr, who is another one of these art game people who also just recently won an award at the Independent Games Festival, who I was fortunate enough to meet there. And his game is called Gravitation. And he's usually inspired by the fact, let's see if this works with sound. Uh, so he's usually inspired by his own life and tries to integrate this into games. So in this case, this is him. <clears throat> and it's freezing, and then there's a ball here, and suddenly I, I play it, and the girl's happy. So, so his his, my, his mild two like one paragraph statement of this game is uh, the creative process, and and real life, right? So, so the way he models this is he says that well, every now and then you come down to earth and you play, but then when you play, it gets you inspired to go out and see what else what else there is in the world. And he actually models this as flaming head. Right? And then when, he, when he's flaming, he can jump extremely high and start collecting these stars. But the problem with the stars is, if I start collecting too many, when they go down, well, first of all, my, my, my view narrows down again. Right? Like, if I'm alone too long, then everything starts getting cold, it gets wintry again, things start flaming down. But then at the bottom here, there's suddenly this, this frozen block, which was the star previously, which it's like an idea that I actually have to take and implement, otherwise it just melts away. But if you take too many ideas without ever making them real, there's just too many of these ice blocks and you can't push them around anymore. So, so the interesting thing about this game, I find, is that there's absolutely nothing in this game that doesn't mean something. Right? This designer has gone through painful lengths, and I, I talked to him, I know this, to make sure that there is no extraneous part of the game that does not have something that is, is, is interpreted by his own game space. Right? This takes a long, long time. This might be a very primitive game. It takes five minutes to play. Right? But it, it just tries to make a point that if you make the effort that the game can actually be, be not mundane, can be, have a very, very strong meaning, and, and can be tied to a single character. In this case, it's him. Right? He actually is modeling him. The girl on the left is his daughter. If you stay away too long in the game and you come back down, the daughter is gone. And the first time I experienced that, I was like, where is she? And so it was really, it had meaning to me at that point. I don't know if, that, if it does the same thing for everyone. I just, I'm just very uh, intrigued by that, that something, that a collection of pixels can do this to me. Yes? And you call this an art game? He called me. He has, he has a blog called arthousegames.com. He himself does not call it an art game. He does work under the, under the patronage model, so all of his income is PayPal. He lives with his, with his wife and his two daughters on a co in a co-op, and he lives off of $10,000 a year. So you, call, you make the call whether he's an artist. Sounds like he's living the life of an artist. Yeah, it sounds, to, me, to me it sounds very much like he's living the life of an artist. Well, I, I would say, there's an aspect of art that, at some point, the thing we call the art is this artifact that actually has not, has very little to do with the value of the whole process, right. and that's what this feels like. Is uh, this was his personal experience working out, working out, and there, we're left with this artifact that we can enjoy the same way that we can enjoy the painting or the sculpture or whatever. True. But he had a completely different experience that was grander, and we. We, we as this other human being that comes to it, we have this moment where we resonate with him, but it, it's, it's not 
the, you know, right. as you've noticed, your experience with it was over in five minutes. Uh, <coughs> but honestly, even your game, yeah. you're still you're you're still two years into it, thousands and thousands of man hours, and you there won't be a single player of your game that gets anywhere close to that. That's true. I don't. I, I, I agree on the on the, on my game. I don't know if it holds for this game. This game has had a long-lasting impact on me. Like in terms of, I talk about it a lot. I think about it a lot. And even from playing it just now again, I think oh, I should actually see what the because I don't think I've gone through all the possibilities of the game. Something that's really valuable about these small games and that lies in the structure of how they're designed is that you can play them a lot of times. Most newer games on the market take 20 hours. No one's going to play that again. Like the the whole notion of Reading a book a second time does not necessarily exist where it really heavily exists in this space. It's another reason why I think this is very intriguing and why I think more people that are interested in this should go out and make a game. It's just something that's, that I, I find it holds a lot of value and it hasn't been fully explored yet. At all, fully. Not a percent. Right? There's a lot, a lot to be done. I have two more examples. Do I, how, am I really, really bad over time? Probably. Really, really bad. Really, really bad? Okay, five minutes. Okay, I'll be done in five minutes. So, the last ex Okay, you know what? I'll, I'll skip this one. It's, no? <laughs> okay, I won't skip this one. Okay, so this is done by... So again, this is done by two people. This is done by Kyle Gabler, who was, an, was a student at uh, Carnegie Mellon in the Entertainment Technology Center, and then went on to EA to hate EA, and then formed his own company. And I don't know why it's not starting up. Huh, preparing to launch. Interesting. OK, let's see if it still starts. So anyway, the idea here was to, so he started a prototype. So the Entertainment Technology has a similar program where they'll expose students to like a week of, like you have a week. Do go out alone and make a game in a week. Whatever you have in a week is your game. So this was a one-week prototype where he just tried to build little trust structures. <coughs> because it uses Steam, maybe tries connecting to the internet. Maybe yeah, maybe I, I, try, I actually tried that before I started here, and I don't because I don't have a connection. But it should it should not care about that too much. Like normally, let me let me let me exit Steam and see if it asks me to log in and then goes into offline mode. Oh God! Ah, uh, everything worked up to now. No. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> oh, Steam updating. That's Amen. not good. <laughs> okay, you know what? It's sorry. There's a demo for it on Steam and on their website. It's the, the company's called 2D Boy. It's 2dboy.com. The interesting thing, which I can also just get out of the image, is again, low degrees of input. You do not have to explicitly, when you're building a trust structure in this game, you do not have to explicitly put a node, add trusses and bars and everything, just by dragging that character over there, that little blob with the cursor around it, you, it, the game shows you where it would be attached if you were to release the mouse button at that point. And then when you release the mouse button, it just constructs it. And the resources are these little goo balls. So with a limited amount of these goo balls, you have to build a trust structure that makes it up to the pipe. That's the most basic variant in this game. It builds on that very, very heavily throughout the five worlds in about five hours of gameplay. And uh, it won all kinds of awards last year, like above, above EA games and like big games, in big game categories, it won awards. Right? So it's just a piece, just a proof of concept that it doesn't always have to be hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of people. I like the games that they make, but it's, it's not the only possible space. Let's see if this video works. So this is the latest thing that I, that I found the other day. No, that's not going to work. It's still updating. So let's see if this video works. So this game is something that, uh, again, a couple of friends of mine are working on. And the concept here is low dimensional input, high dimensional output. The character is only controlling the shadow. So it's only left right on the keyboard. But when they actually touch stuff in the shadow world, it moves stuff in the, in the physical world. <laughs> And then, of course, based on this, again, like this is the 5% thing. And then based on that, they make this principle that, oh, look, I can jump over the chasm if I jump onto the projected shadow. And then <laughs> so they build around that concept, and it gets, it gets crazy. It gets crazy really, really fast. So once people start thinking outside of the box, miraculous things happen. And in, in the game space lately, that's been happening on like a weekly basis almost. 
So it's, it's very, very exciting to be following this. Right. So I, I've talked about this enough. It's not just nostalgia. It's really, really the slow dimensional space. And the game developers are not even so much aware of the fact that they're doing themselves a favor. It's not like the artists that would say, let's not use an F in our book or something like that. They're very aware of what kind of limitations they're putting themselves under. These people are not even aware of it. But then when I tell them about it, they're like, oh, yeah, I guess you're onto something. So that's why I'm talking about it today. Yeah, this is, OK. Jump over it. Jump over research. Show one last demo. This is, this is, my, this is my short game feel demo where, that I usually show to my students, where I ask them, do they see a difference in the physics between me moving like this or me moving like this? <laughs> and most of the people will say, oh yeah, sure, sure, it's a, lot more, it's, a lot, it's a lot more responsive, it's a lot more this, that, and the other thing. There's no difference at all. Right? That's not the point. The point is, they meet, this is not a game. This is a game, suddenly. And they're like, oh yeah, look, I can try to push those blocks over there, and this and the other thing. This is probably like 10 lines more of code than, than this. All right? And suddenly it's turned into a game. So again, this is pure sense pleasure. This has absolutely nothing to do with a game rule or anything. This is not a physics simulation. This is all very much hacked together. Right? And yet, and yet, it can give people the sense that they're doing something important and meaningful. And I'm not saying that you need to trick people with that, but I'm just saying that is one key to getting people to start. So when I make a game, I usually start with something that people touch and go, ooh, wow, let me try this. And I'm like, okay, I'll build from there. Because I need the people to be, have like the, the, you have like five seconds to get people tied, and then they'll at least look at it, and maybe they'll be interested, right? Yeah, this is, this is where I see this going, because I see that most people that talk about this at the university are from all these fields, right? In fact, here at Rutgers, they have the, the English department that's working on digital composition and trying to teach their students how to code in, in ActionScript in Flash, right? And they're talking to me about these things. Perceptual science, cognitive science, very strong, and obviously the arts. And I'd say it starts at computer science because that's where we implement the game. But that's not, obviously not true, and it's my view of the world. It's, the, again, very idiosyncratic. But I just think that all this has to come together for this to work. And this is, I hope, the last slide. So yeah, there's going to be more interesting visualizations. There's been a lot of research in non-photorealistic rendering. And I don't think that it's been used enough in games yet. It has been, but only to a very, very limited degree. Line art drawings, I haven't seen much of that in games. Um, I'm expecting more rich interactions. I'm expecting people to use more aspects, such as the shadows I just showed you, but also use more aspects of time to like, know that if you hold something long or do something longer, that it has more value. Most people just work very binary and only in like, a single frame of time and not over time when they think about interactions inside of a digital game. Um, educational tools is such an obvious thing. And the only reason I'm saying that is not for the, oh, we need to use games as educational tools because NSF is going to fund it better and whatnot. I'm saying it because there's so many, many people playing games. And like, as I said way in the beginning, games are value statements. Even if game designers keep on saying stuff like, we just want to make it fun and we're not being political or anything, that doesn't work. People, there's always a value statement in all these things. And even if they don't want it to be there, it's there and it's their responsibility to take care of that. Right, and I'm expecting more participatory art forms. And I see most, many of these things going on in art exhibitions in New York City these days. I'm expecting more of that to happen. And what hasn't been explored at all yet, or not to the degree I'd like, is adaptive games where the rules are actually not rigid, where they adapt over time, where they adapt to a specific player, and where you'd expect that there's still enough communication between the people that play these games based on the fact that the coloring and the setting is similar, but that the game will adapt to each player individually. Too much time. Thanks. Okay. Uh, possibly time for just a few quick questions before we get on to the next speaker. Yeah. Uh, it's mostly comments on the question on where we would reach that uh, threshold. Uh, there is a good interview on NPR with uh, the director of uh, Curious K Show. But in which I didn't. It's working. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, sorry, keep going. No problem. No, I can, I can do uh, yeah, so it. Yeah, making multitask. Well, that when, when it becomes very close to a human being, 
then people suddenly become very sensitive and even minor uh, inconsistencies uh, really throw them off. So they stop believing and uh, he believes that that's the first time actually in that movie when they were able to do like real humans. So people watch and they don't have that feeling of um, that it's untrue. So that's, uh, that's his statement. I haven't watched the movie, but from the um, parts I've seen, I, I would say, well, it's the point. It was to address the question of like, where we would reach that stage when our virtual characters are. Yeah, what do you, I mean, what do you think about Benjamin Button, I guess, is the bottom line. And, and on that I continuum seen, tour. Okay, it's so bad, I haven't seen the movie yet. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and it's really, really high on my to-do list, but it wasn't, it wasn't close to a paper deadline. One of the, and, it's, and actually, quite fun, the French submission deadline for Osmos was in the same week, so I haven't seen it yet. Sorry, I have, I have seen, I have watched and seen Beowulf, which, which uh, yeah, well, Benjamin Button's much better than okay, Beowulf okay. in terms of you know the progression towards ameliorating that uncanny guy. But again, it's not there yet, but it, you know, again, it's going to talk about that. It's in a very controlled environment of film. Which, which uh, obviously is very different from a game. And they have only one character to work with, like essentially just that person. Right. So it's not like there are 20 of them, just one. Mm -hmm. And they spent a lot of time. <coughs> and they spent a lot of money. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> That's also a point. But that doesn't, I mean, what that, ju what that essentially says to me that we're getting there. And it's obvious that it's possible. And, and this, this talk very much sounds like I'm always like bashing on the games industry and everything. I love shooters. Right? It's not like I don't like the games. It's just that I'm missing a lot in them. And when a part comes in and they're like, oh, let's take this environment to make drama, and I'm like, why? Like, why don't you start at square one? Like, people just have a big, big problem throwing away 20 years of research to say, we actually can't do this in this environment. We should start smaller. That just hasn't happened. Anyway, that's, this is what we do. Like, you just click on these guys, and then when you get closer to one of these, hints at the fact that it's going to build, and then when I let go, it's, it just attaches it, and then it's a physical simulation, and I have to reach that pipe up there. And I'm doing a terrible job of doing that right now. There, And then the rest of the people, the little goo balls I haven't used, just run out of the pipe. <laughs> and then I get a score based on that. So there's like a very video game thing to do, obviously, but players like to see, <laughs> this is why I saved, this is how long it took me, there's the time, like all kinds of statistics about about the success rate. Okay, I, I think I'll move on with that. So thanks a lot.